Welcome to Facebook Live from the Weather Channel. I am Oral in Sydney. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We have a special treat for me <laughs> and you. We're going to be joined by Dr. Zeb Hogan, who is the host of Nat Geo Wild's Monster Fish. He is an ecologist, a National Geographic fellow, and the host of that show. We're going to be joining him from the Tennessee Aquarium in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where there is a monster fish exhibit that's going to be going on through April. Dr. Zeb Hogan, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be with you. Wow. Tell us what's going on in Tennessee. Let's start there. Yeah, so right now I am in a 6,000 square foot exhibit that's dedicated to monster fish that where you can come and learn all about the world's largest freshwater fish. There are sculptures, life-size sculptures, videos, boats, illustrations, games, and it's all right here at the Tennessee Aquarium until April 16th. Well, you're not going to believe this, but freshwater big fish is a thing of mine. I absolutely love your show. I feel like I know you already. This is absolutely fascinating for me, and I am going to come to this exhibit. I'm so glad it's going to be until April the 16th. And is it at the Tennessee Aquarium, or is it in, in the actual building, or where is it located? Well, so when people come to the aquarium, they can... Uh... It's actually upstairs from where people will purchase their tickets, but anyone at the aquarium will know where the exhibit is. So when people come to the aquarium, just ask about monster fish, and I'm sure that people will get pointed in the right direction. Okay, so why don't you tell us, what is a monster fish? Well, so this is a, a project I've been working on for the last 10 years, and it's a project to find, study, and protect the world's largest freshwater fish. So this is a search for real-life Loch Ness monsters freshwater fish that grow at least six feet long or weigh more than 200 pounds. And it's a diverse assemblage of fish. Uh, some fish people might have heard about, catfish, carp, they get up to 200, 300, 400 pounds, uh, electric eels, uh, arapaima, which is a big species of fish in South America, freshwater stingrays. And so you can see, actually, if people come to the exhibit, you can see behind me, there's an American paddlefish. That's a species that lives here in North America in the Mississippi River that gets up to about six feet long, 200 pounds. Then we also have a giant carp, which is uh, the largest carp species in the world. It gets up to 10 feet long, 600 pounds. Freshwater uh, sawfish over here. So this is a species that is found in freshwater, uh, lives its first part of its life in freshwater. It gets up to about seven or eight feet long moves out to the sea and ultimately gets over 20 feet long. That's incredible. Now, the carp that you just showed me, I've always thought carp are like giant goldfish. Is that really true? Yeah, so this, this carp that's in the background here, so it's a relative of the goldfish. Uh, it's a 600 pound goldfish. Uh, <laughs> and as a full grown fish would have scale about the size of my hand. So this is a huge fish. We think it's a very long lived fish. Some of these fish, uh, sturgeon big sturgeon big eels maybe these giant carp can live over a hundred years that is incredible now listen i grew up in central texas my dad and i used to go fishing every sunday after church very often in church shoes my mom didn't like that and guess what we were fishing for alligator gar do you have any of those in the exhibit yeah so we have a uh, live alligator gar over at the aquarium we have a section of the exhibit that's dedicated to north american fish uh, so we have information about alligator gar and I was actually, I just was down in Texas last week in Dallas and you, you may know this, the North America's healthiest population of alligator gar is in the Trinity River between Dallas and Houston. So I don't know if that's where you used to go fishing, but there are some enormous alligator gar in that stretch of river. Yeah, and those are, those are mean fish. They have a bad reputation. They look mean, they're harmless. Now you said in a, a TEDx talk that I that I heard that these monster fish are really not necessarily critically endangered. Some of them, but up to seventy percent of these fish are really having problems surviving. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean most people don't realize. Uh, some people, the first time that they see a lot of these fish, like alligator gar, uh, a lot of these fish look scary, and people see these sculptures, realize how big these fish are, and their initial reaction is to be afraid or to not want to go in the water. But actually, like you were saying, about 70% of these fish are threatened with extinction. So fish like the giant carp, uh, giant carp, Mekong giant catfish, longfin eel, 
a lot of these species are at the brink of extinction and there are only a few specimens seen each year. So really, rather than be afraid of these fish, these fish really need our help. So what is it that we can do? Because I know, well, these are my guesses anyway, that these fish are in danger of extinction because I would imagine habitat, uh, habitat destruction, overfishing. What kinds of things can we do to change this trend, to kind of backtrack and, and help these fish make it into the future? Yeah, I mean, I, it's simple, simple steps. I mean, the first step is uh, get your kids outside. People themselves get outside. Bring your kids to aquariums. Take them to zoos. Get them turn, turned on to nature. Uh, we want to get past that fear that people have of animals like this. And so once people get past that fear and start to appreciate these fish, then I think that's when people start to take action to try to protect them. So anything people can do to protect rivers, to protect lakes, to keep water pollution free, uh, practice catch and release fishing. So a lot of people do that already. For You don't have to practice catch and release fishing for all fish, but for endangered fish, for rare fish, go out there, catch a fish, but then after you catch it, treat it well, keep it in the water and release it back to the river. So there are actually a lot of very simple things that people can do. And really what it comes down to is just taking care of the environment, being a good steward of the environment and not doing anything to either, uh, you know, destroy river habitat or pollute it or take too many fish out of the river. Well, now tell us about your show, which is a very, very successful series on Nat Geo Wild called Monster Fish. You've been on the air since 2010. That is a very, very good run in TV land. Of course, I'm sure you know that. Yeah, so uh, Nat, Nat Geo Wild, I've been working with Nat Geo Wild for almost 10 years now. But like you said, the show is called Monster Fish, and each show, uh, we go to a different place, a different region. We focus on a, a different species of giant fish, unusual fish, and different cultures. Of people that fish for uh, these species that depend on them for their livelihoods. Uh, we filmed six seasons so far, so almost 40 shows, and we're just about to start filming season seven right now. So I hope for people out there who like the show, uh, we don't do a lot of shows, but we do a few shows every year. So we'll have some new shows coming out soon. That's fantastic. I'm going to be front row center because, like I said, I love the show. It's a fantastic show. Let me ask you this question. What are the hardest freshwater fish to find now? Which which of these fish that you're, uh, if they're even not in the exhibit, I know there's like 20 species that are in the exhibit, but what are the fish that are the hardest to find? Who's who's on yeah. the brink of extinction? Yeah, a lot of these fish are, are very difficult to find. So to give you an example, uh, I was trying to study the Mekong giant catfish, which is the current record holder for world's largest freshwater fish. It's a catfish that lives in Southeast Asia that gets up to 650 pounds. Wow. And I was a fisherman in Southeast Asia for about 10 years trying to get a healthy Mekong giant catfish to tag, release, and then follow its migration. It took me 10 years until I successfully was able to tag and release a Mekong giant catfish. So some of these fish, they're only found uh, once a year. Uh, some, some fish aren't even seen uh, at all in a given year. So some of these fish are very, very difficult to find. Um, trying to think of some of the fish that we haven't done shows on, Chinese paddlefish. Uh, I would love to see a Chinese paddlefish. It's an incredibly unique fish, endemic to the Yangtze River, used to get up to about two, uh, 20 feet long. No Chinese paddlefish have been seen since 2007. Wow. So that one of these, these monster fish, one of these huge fish that, that may have already gone extinct. And really that's what we're up against. These fish were much more common in the past, but now the populations as they decline, these fish become more and more rare. They're becoming harder and harder to find. Well, now is it also because these fish are very slow growers and don't breed as often, like, you know, maybe not once every you know, year or so? Is that part of the problem as well? You fish out all the small fish and they just don't have time to grow into bigger fish? Yeah, exactly. So you imagine a guppy, if most, a lot of people have guppies at home, they reproduce very quickly. So if you start, you could start with two guppies. I used to have guppies when I was a kid. And by the end of the year, you might have a tank full of two or 300 guppies. With some of these big fish, sturgeon, for example, they don't mature until they're 15 or 20 years old. So you'd have to wait 15 or 20 years before those fish would reproduce a single time. And so you think if, you know, people are out there fishing, if there are problems in the environment, those fish have to survive for a long time before they can even reproduce one time. But to take an extreme example, the longfin eel in New Zealand can live for 100 years. Uh, it has one of the most unique and long distance migrations of any fish. So they actually spawn out in the ocean. The young fish somehow make their way to New Zealand up 
streams and rivers in New Zealand where they can live for up to 100 years without spawning a single time, at the very end of their life, they move back down streams and rivers, back out to the ocean, out to spawn. They can migrate thousands of miles and then they die. So that's an extreme example of a fish that only spawns once in 100 years. So we'd have to wait 100 years without catching any of those fish for those fish to even have the next generation of fish. Yeah, so th th these fish, they're evolved. If you think about, for example, a sturgeon, it takes 20 years for a sturgeon until it's able to reproduce. But that's part of the, the elegant kind of way that the sturgeon is adapted to its environment. Sturgeon can live for 100 years. And so what they're doing is they're surviving. They're survivors. They survive for a really long time. They're waiting for that one good year, that one really good year. And then they, they'll all spawn. They'll have a really good year. And that can sustain a population for the next generation. And mm -hmm. that's sort of fine. So it's not that these fish can't withstand any fishing, but we just need to um, manage their populations well, be good stewards, and kind of be aware of, of the situation and the status of these fish so that they don't go extinct. Okay. Where does aquaculture come into this? Is there a possibility that something like that could help to eliminate some of the pressure on these species? Yeah, so aquaculture, I mean, there are at least two ways that aquaculture plays a very large role in the conservation of these fish. The first way aquaculture is important is that aquaculture is a great source of food, for fish for people to eat for food. So rather than eating some of these endangered fish that need to be harvested from the wild, people can eat catfish, uh, aquacultured catfish here. We have big catfish culture in the United States, cat, uh, farmed salmon, farmed tilapia. So that's a way to take some of the pressure off of these wild fish. And then like you were saying, another reason that aquaculture is important is for example, here in Tennessee, there's a program to captive breed lake sturgeon in captivity. They're actually raised here at the aquarium and then released back into the wild. And so that's a way that we, if we can breed these fish in captivity, bring their population numbers up, make sure the river's healthy, and then put them back in the river. That is an excellent idea. And I'm hoping that a lot of people come to the Tennessee Aquarium to see not just this exhibit, but the entire aquarium. I gotta tell you, Tennessee Aquarium is one of my favorite places. I've been there several times. And again, I'm gonna be coming back to see this exhibit before it leaves. Dr. Zeb Hogan of Nat Geo Wild Monster Fish, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much.